psychiatrist, psychologists aren't much help at all. Biological illness in the brain, psychology just goes right by them. Oh, yeah. So I'm just wondering, um, in this day and age, uh, how is it that prisoners have the opportunity to attack each other or even murder each other? Because you would think, you know, a prison would prevent that from happening. Yeah. Um, we had five murders inside federal penitentiaries last fiscal year. Oh. Um, and the year before, I think there was only one. Um, so I'm hoping that that's not a trend, that it's just a, that it's a, it's a tragic aberration. Um, remember I was talking about the gang mixing? Mm -hmm. We had one murder that took place because despite information on file that these two fellows were incompatible, they uh, were placed, um, they were placed in the same, uh, the same range so that their, their yard line was the same. And um, there was uh, bad blood from the street. You know, there was a problem that was in the street before incarceration. It was settled in the prison yard and one of them ended up uh, being killed. Can't they guards keep control on the yard? Like, you know, keep them uh, separated too? Uh, you know, I, I, in, a, in an ideal world, yes. Um, <laughs> But as I said, prisons can be chaotic, um, and guards can't be everywhere. And what about holes in the guard? Yeah. Yeah. As I said, these, in, in spite of the file information, these people were inappropriately placed with one another. We even have a situation where one inmate who has a history of violence inside, who had said, don't ever double bunk me with anybody or I'll kill him, was then given a cellmate, and he in fact did kill him. So um, sometimes, you know, sometimes the, 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 the system uh, messes up. And what about segregating the exercise yard, like both by times and also keeping inmates far enough? They, do, they do do that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they do do that. I'm wondering with the aging demographic, um, if you're seeing uh, any significant increase or, or um, reincarceration of senior offenders who have been long-term parolees uh, for age-related uh, illnesses such as dementia or um, this sort of thing? Um, I don't have it broken down by reason for return to incarceration. We, we know that uh, long-serving offenders tend to be better Older offenders tend to be better risks on parole. In other words, they commit less crime. They, I don't know whether they commit at a higher or lower rate in fractions of their conditions of release, so those administrative issues. Um, we know that the number of offenders that are aging in place is increasing for, uh, we believe, three reasons. One is it reflects the general aging in society. Canada's getting older. Um, our prison population reflects that. Number two, the age at first admission has gone up in the last 10 years. So we're actually seeing um, um, older, and in, in this context I just mean like older than 20, like older people, uh, at an older age, your first admission. So the average age at admission is increased. You can see the stacking effect of life sentencing. You know, it's been about 34 years since um, we've had the life 15, life 25 sentences. So that's life sentence with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. So we're seeing people spend, life sentence defenders spend on average 28.6, uh, I think it is, years before parole release, mm -hmm. which is actually one of the longest periods of incarceration in the Western world uh, for, 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 a, for a life mm -hmm. sentence. Um, so we're, we're seeing that. So when you start seeing um, people spending 30 years in prison and, they're not, and their age of admission is 30, it means you're already 60 um, before you're even eligible for release. Um, and so be, there's about 3,500 life-serving offenders right now in custody. So that's going to just increase. Now, um, when those individuals come out, they tend to be pretty low risk for reoffense. But I don't have the breakdown on those re 
returned to incarceration for a new criminal conviction versus those returned to incarceration for a violation of conditions. Right. I understand what you're saying. Um, but I'm wondering if um, sometimes they're re-incarcerated, not related to a new criminal offense, but perhaps because they're starting to suffer the um, right. you know, effects of aging within the community, but because they're under the federal auspices, they are returned. Right. That would be a condition, or that's what I'm, right. I, I mean, okay. that would be like a condition. Yeah. So, so they didn't report. They right. forgot to go see their parole officer. Right. So they get breached. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. I have two points. You mentioned that uh, the Kingston prison was 150 years old. This summer we went to uh, Ottawa and we stayed in the youth hostel, which is the old Ottawa prison, yeah. and we went on the tour of it. Can you convince me that there's newer parts to the Kingston hostel? Yes. Is it... Uh, as gassy, the same architecture as the Ottawa one. Um, no, Kingston. The some some of the original architecture for Kingston exists, um, but there's but there's been there's been lots of investment inside Kingston. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thanks for telling. <laughs> no, I just want to see you. That's all. Sorry about that. cynicism that Harper's putting another 60 million into it. Uh, I see a need for counter, uh, like uh, your talk is, indicates that there must be an awful lot of work of computer technicians putting all the stats together um, that a lot must have, uh, the money must be going into mental health. There needs to be some countering. It's not just for putting more people into jails. That some of that money is getting used to modernize it, or isn't um, that so? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just, just going to take a minute. Just. <laughs> the, the, um, yeah. okay, well, let, let me let me see. If, let, um, the sixty million dollars over five years, starting in two thousand and five, that I saw you saw on the screen. None of that had to do with <coughs> policy-driven changes. So, so none of that came as came about. None of that sixty million dollars came about as a result of um, law reform or policy change brought in by the government. That was driven by identified need within the correctional service to deal with specific mental health related programming or services and to build capacity in the service to respond to mentally ill offenders. Um, so that's new investment that the government gave the Correctional Service of Canada to address an identified need within the existing population. Full stop. There's been a number of policy changes which will result in more people spending more time in prison. Um, the new money that has been allocated to address that is aimed towards building physical capacity to house this influx of offenders. Um, we don't know how much of that money will eventually be made available for treatment or programs. We don't even know if the physical design takes into account the changing demographics of the population. So for example, we know about the growth in elderly offenders. We don't know if the physical designs um, have been adjusted so that aisleways are big enough for wheelchairs and cells are big enough for hospital beds. So, we don't know. Um, uh, what we do know is that today, the Correctional Service has a budget of under $4 billion. It'll grow to over $4 billion. Um, and about 2% of that money is spent on programs, core correctional programs, 2%. So um, even if that ratio is kept, we're not sure that it will be adequate to meet the kind of demand that we're projecting. <coughs> are, are we dropping Peter to pay Paul? Like, you've identified the need that needs to be done in the mental health area. Do you include addictions and substance abuse in that? I, well, have, I, yeah, I have an 
that I haven't addressed substance abuse um, directly, um, well, only in terms of the comorbidity. That it, I mean, your stats and uh, CSC's own information that they put out on their little visitor's handbook, 80% of offenders arrive at an institution with a substance abuse program problem and more than half were intoxicated when they committed the crime for which they're serving time. So when I first looked at the computer about a year ago, I guess under the solicitor general information about our beautiful prison and its systems and the best programs in the world, they had high intensity substance abuse, medium intensity, and um, just substance abuse programs. But now, I don't know if it's across Canada, but in BC, they've been eliminated, and the substance abuse programs are just a small part of the regular criminal behavior program. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, like, were you robbing Peter to pay Paul? Sure, we get more mental health stuff, but then it's is it being taken from something else? What happened to the that? Okay. Um, well, uh, what's the best way? The um, uh, the Correctional Service Canada uh, has a number of core programs. Every offender is given a correctional plan. Mm -hmm. So after admission, they go through an assessment process, right. and they're given a correctional plan. And that right. correctional plan identifies what are called criminogenic factors. Mm -hmm. And so those criminogenic factors have to do with substance abuse, or relationships, or employment, or you know, a whole, there's, there's right. a number of dimensions they look at. And then the Correctional Service of Canada has these validated programs, programs that have been designed and evaluated and measured to have the, 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 the and they demonstrated they have the, the desired impact, that they change behavior in a certain way. Um, and so offenders are in essence, through the correctional plan, prescribed a program to meet their needs. Um, now the difficulty with that approach is that um, there's, there have been huge waiting lists to get offenders into program. There's been huge, huge delays. Um, the programs start way too late in the sentence. Um, there's capacity issues, classroom space issues, uh, not enough program delivery people, all, all kinds of you things. You have to wait six months so, to take your maintenance So to address now. that, the Correctional Service of Canada said, okay, we're going to streamline the program process. We're going to make it easier and faster to get people into programs. Mm -hmm. We're going to address that bottleneck by changing our model to get people more into, you know, to get more people in the program sooner, so they get the benefit of these programs. So the way they did that is they developed something called the Integrated Correctional Program Plan Model, ICPM. Okay, so they got the ICPM. They're piloting the ICPM in British Columbia and in the Atlantic region. And the idea is to see whether or not these new condensed programs that are designed in modules have the same desired impact, whether in fact it gets people in the programs more quickly, and whether the programs are just as valid, that they have the same desired impact on behavior. Um, we're very concerned, and in fact, we address it in the report, that they're going to move ahead and roll out the ICPM across the country, eliminate all the core programs, and not get not wait for the benefit of the evaluation to see whether or not they still work. 